I am uh, with Gary Goldstein today, and uh, those of you may not know him, Gary um, is the uh, former San Francisco hippie lawyer who turned Hollywood producer. He's produced the notable films such as Under Siege, Mothman Prophecies, and Pretty Woman. But we're going to talk to him today about um, publishing his book called Conquering Hollywood and how he used Kickstarter to get this campaign started and get his book really positioned and out there and whatnot. Um, you produced a bunch of movies, Gary, and including one um, nature film, I understand, right? Some of the Amazon? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, what was that? Cannibal Women in the Avocado Jungle of Death. Yes, indeed. See, I've seen all the other ones. I've seen Mothman. I've seen Under Siege and pre I've not seen the, the, the Cannibal Women one. There, there's actually a number you haven't seen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving right along. Um, I want to talk to you about Kickstarter, but I want to give somebody a framework. To, you know, we're going to have fun today. We're going to really just get into this deep and dirty, but we're also real people who have a lot of fun. So um, we've heard about crowdfunding. We don't need to go into crowdfunding uh, generalities or specifics. People who don't know about it can go Google it. We're going to talk about successful campaigns and even some of the um, things you've seen which don't work. I think people can learn equally from what has worked and what has not worked. So first of all, the big, the big picture from 30,000 feet, why did you choose to use Kickstarter to get your book out there? Well, it was actually not a, a logical choice uh, or, or an easy choice initially because, number one, it was new to me, like it is to so mm-hmm. many. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, I just got an email from Doug Lip, wonderful guy, uh, dean of Disney University and head of Imagineering, who is just now sort of getting rumblings about Kickstarter and crowdfunding. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was new to me. So, and secondly, um, I'm not. I don't position myself generally as a very public person. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, I've never been in front of the camera. I live behind the camera for a reason. It's just more comfortable. So the idea of going very public uh, was not entirely comfortable uh, and, and, and with the understanding that if you're going to be successful in the new sharing economy in this crowdsourcing mm-hmm. universe, uh, it's not enough to go public. You have to really like deeply connect with people. That means tell your truth, your raw, uh, unvarnished gospel of truth and be vulnerable. So Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, sure how I would position or message that. Uh, that was a, you know, so there were a lot of things about it that I didn't understand hadn't done before. Uh, but I like challenges. Here's why I decided to do it why I overcame all those sort of internal objections uh, and said, I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I know it's very consuming. Like people should not have the illusion that you put up a a short (laughs) piece of text in a video and, and let it run for 30 days and people are going to throw money at you. It does not work that way. This is a, um, a real commitment. Um, It it, it has to almost live at the level of mission. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason I decided to overcome my internal objections and actually walk down that path of doing my first campaign, a crowdfunding campaign, is I had written this manuscript. Um, it was a manuscript born of, you know, a couple of dozen years of experience in the Hollywood uh, entertainment uh, film and TV community. Before I began producing, I was managing and I had to learn out of desperation because I didn't know anyone when I started here. I didn't know you know a lot. In order to build a business and not go broke, I had to find talent willing to be represented by a new guy uh, and together uh, find ways to succeed and, 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 and create careers and create incomes and create viability for creative uh, uh, aspirants, right? Mm-hmm. So I wrote this book. Um, in answer to the number of people who kept asking over the years, <laughs> um, how do you do this? How do you break in? How do you make a living as a creative? Whether you're an actor, a screenwriter, a producer, pretty much anything, an author, a, a sculptor, it doesn't matter. If you're a creative professional or a wannabe, how do you do it? And so I applied these entrepreneurial strategies that I had tested and proven over time to work, and all the ones that didn't got tossed down. So I wrote the book so that I didn't have to answer one-on-one or even do teleseminars, but that if when people ask, I would say, go get the book. There's actually now, there's hundreds of books on Amazon or on the bookshelves of Barnes and Noble elsewhere 
if you are interested in how to be better, how to write a better screenplay, how to be a better actor, how to be better at mm-hmm. your craft, there's a lot of teachers and some of them, many of them are great. But despite the hundreds of teachers on craft, there's really not yet been one book entirely devoted, dedicated just to the question of career. How do you turn your talent into a business? So that was my motivation for writing the book. I wrote the book. I had it as a manuscript. I even went through the editorial process. And it was sitting gathering dust on my hard drive. I could not figure out why to go through all the time and expense and effort uh, to explore this whole new fast-changing landscape of of publishing and self-publishing to figure out how I would do it when all I was going to do was spend a lot of money, get a lot of books printed, and stare at these boxes filled with books sitting against the wall of my office. Because I had no audience. I had no pre-built market for my book. Mm -hmm. So the idea of Kickstarter got really exciting to me when I realized, oh my God, I could build a community. I could build a tribe. I could make a big noise and get in big conversation with thousands of people not just on Kickstarter, because it spokes out to all of our social platforms, my mm-hmm. database, my Facebook, Twitter, you name it, even even Instagram or Pinterest, whatever, any platform you like. So you can you can you can use traditional media, radio, TV, newspaper, you can use um, online. I blogged on Huffington Post, we'll get into all this. But you could you could create this big conversation and actually pre- sell your book, and I think of it less as pre-selling product uh, and more as seeding a community. So the, I think that's the, pretty the, unique. Most people are looking at this as need a way to you know raise funds for their product or book or business, and your first thing out of your mouth was about building your tribe. It's all about audience. I mean, it doesn't matter how sexy your widget. People fall in love with their product, services, whatever. Uh, if, if it's not loved by others and a lot of them, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I would rather, the, I think the, the, the thing that is brand new that is really available now for the first time ever based because of our technology is the ability for we entrepreneurs, creative or otherwise, to actually find our audience before we go mm-hmm. completely down the rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was that, Doug. Basically, that was it. It was like, oh my God, I could build a community that's not just an an audience to buy the book, but I can actually then have this ongoing conversation with these thousands of people who contributed to the conversation. Not all of them donated. Not all of them were monetary backers. There were, uh, I forget, about four hundred and fifteen or four hundred and twenty who actually opened their wallets, gave money. But there were a lot more than that who participated actively through um, through conversation, huh. and that got really exciting to me. So that was really what tipped the scales for me and made me say, yes, it's time for me to do my first Kickstarter campaign. Terrific. Okay, we'll get into, into tactics in the, the second section. I wanted to finish up with the strategy part of, I got the why, um, in terms of the, the strategy to, to make them successful. Well, you know, not 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 get not too deep. Don't do too details here. But what's the overall strategy to make these things, these crowdfunding projects, work? Um, I, I think it's really not. You know, we can top line that, and it, I, there's certain basic things. And when you think about them in hindsight, they're really obvious. They're really fundamental to our humanity, but mm-hmm. uh, maybe not evident to everybody who might be thinking about doing a campaign. I think there, it really boils down to, in, in order of priority, the most important is people want to see that you are on fire. They want to know why you're doing what you're doing. Who are you? Why do you care? Why is this so important to you? Why is this a must-accomplish project? And what's the good that it's going to do? Um, where did you birth this idea? What's your life experience that made this so compelling for you? When you start right. talking those terms, those emotionally and psychologically and physically compelling ways to say to people, hey, I really care about this. 
this is my life. I've, been, you know, I've, I've, I've dedicated so much time in learning to this, and I know how to help people, or this is going to do X, Y, and Z. Um, that, that, that is the key um, to especially the video, but I would say the same kind of storytelling, if you will, the story behind the story is more important in the text than a lot of features. It's like the real world. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, well, you know what? It's, it's big, big disclaimer here. You've been a mentor of mine for years, but getting back to the story section, that's what I'm picking up from your conversation here, is that if you've got a compelling story and you're passionate about it, that, that attracts other people and, and like-minded people to your cause and your mission. I think that's a critical component is making that story just pop. Yeah, absolutely. I know that, forget the web, forget uh, Kickstarter mm -hmm. or crowdfunding yep. or online life. This is so basic to the way we are emotionally wired, our DNA as consumers. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm looking for to buy something, let's say it's a car. And there's there's Auto Row and there's all these people and they're selling often what look like the same damn car to me up and down the street. <laughs> if I'm out there searching and I'm just comparing uh, features and benefit and and price point, mm -hmm. you know all of that, then then everybody is in competition for my dollars. Yep. And 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 I don't have um, I have anxiety because I got to figure out what's the best deal. Mm -hmm. But then suddenly I walk into a dealership and I meet one person, a male or a female, who is ebullient, who is almost prosaic, poetic, uh, enraptured by uh, the product. That they're in love. They know it. They've lived it. They grew up. Mm -hmm. their father, they tell me stories about their father when they got their first Chevy Impala or whatever it is. I'm, I'm making up right. silly stuff. I know. But when I see that they are in love, they they know as much as they know because they care about it deeply. It's really a part of their life. It's not a job. They're not looking at a commission. They're, they'd be there anyway. Right. Very well, interesting. Yeah, I'm just reflect, making me reflect on my last car purchase. Yeah. You're exactly right. That guy was yeah. really excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. So when you meet that person... The others are no longer in competition. You will buy from the person that you connect with, who makes it interesting, who cares, who lights you up about it, because now it's an experience. It's not just a product. Right. Very cool. Okay. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a really huge lesson for, like you said, Kickstarter aside, it doesn't matter. Whatever your, whatever your mission is in life is to don't be afraid of it and embrace it wholeheartedly. Let's let's talk about Kickstarter specifically now. You got you had a a goal and you exceeded that goal in your campaign. Why don't you go and just give us the quick uh, the quick uh, overview in your numbers that were very impressive? Yeah, the um, I, I we asked as a numeric reality we asked for twelve thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and that was a very conscious choice. I did it in part because I knew it wasn't enough. If I listed and I told people what it was for, by the way, very important. You tell people, yes. what is this money going toward? Mm -hmm. uh, how are you spending their after tax dollars? <laughs> but <laughs> I, so I told them, I need a proofreader. I need an editor. I need a, a, an e format person. I need a website designer. I need, and it went on and on, a book cover designer. And I mean, the list, there were like, I don't know, 15 things in there. Right. Now, I said, and by the way, the 12000 won't cover all of it, but it'll go a long way toward covering those costs. Mm. Um, my concern in part was, and not to the, the, uh, uh, shine a light on it, but because of certain very public success, when people associate me with something like Pretty Woman, right. um, I was very concerned they would logically say, what is this guy doing on Kickstarter <laughs> asking for $12,000? Is this guy out of his mind? <laughs> and so, and, and I, and, and the irony, the, or not the irony, but what surprised me, Doug, was that I got to ask that question, but I think I got asked that question three times in 30 days, like not a lot. And mm -hmm. the beautiful thing is the people who asked that question, when I answered them and I answered them full on a hundred percent immediately at length, wrote the mini essays, told them the truth, mm -hmm. they became some of my biggest supporters. Right. Um, so don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Go just both feet, dive, jump, cannonball right into the heart of the pool of truth, and people will follow you. They're looking for that kind of leadership. 
But I asked for 12 for a couple of reasons. I believe that on Kickstarter or any of these platforms, and there's Mm -hmm. many more of them now, um, that one of the strategies that you go for is to understanding human nature. It seems wise to ask for a number that you comfortably believe you will achieve. It's not like, oh, Mm -hmm. my God. I'm, you know, 20 days into a 30 day campaign and I'm only a fourth or a fifth of the way to my goal and I've got to, you know, and I'm going to fail. No, it's about creating a success model. It's about creating the yes habit. What happens is if you achieve, um, in, in the first, um, you know, in the first week of a 30 day campaign, you want to get probably at least 30% of the way to your goal. Mm-hmm. And if you can do that, you will succeed. You will hit your mark. But what also happens is when people see that you're going to succeed, they jump on yep. board and push you way past your goal. Uh huh. Uh huh. They just people want to line up, be a part of uh, something that is sure to be a success. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what happened. We we went for twelve thousand dollars. We ended up raising twenty five, uh, almost twenty six thousand dollars. So we were about two. I forget the number. It was like two hundred and fifteen percent of our goal. Right. Um, and um, uh, and and that was very intentional. We kind of we we actually our real internal goal was was at least double. We were uh, had I you know it was my first time. There were certain things that I know now that I would have pushed even harder and tried to go almost three times the goal. But um, you see that happening with a lot uh, in, in crowdfunding. You see projects that are asking for 10,000, raising a hundred thousand or asking for a hundred thousand, raising a million. And part of it is just, does it connect with people? Mm-hmm. So I think that's, that's the biggest thing that you, you want to make sure um, that you're connecting with people before you go live with your campaign. You want to go. Yeah. Is there, is there a way to test this at all? I mean, once you start there, I know on Kickstarter, if you don't raise it, you know, they, they get nothing. Well, yeah, there are unfortunately people who do that. Um, I just, uh, well, here's one of the things I, um, just got a, uh, had an hour long uh, Skype call with London last late last week. Mm-hmm. Filmmaker, filmmakers putting up a campaign, uh, raising a lot more money than I'm, than I was asking, uh, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these are two brothers. They had an amazing cast. I mean, I, I they, they were a great example of a, a, a crowdfunding campaign that got it both as right as you can get it and as wrong as you can get it at wow. the same time, which was fascinating because here are two brothers who are filmmakers and they had a, an amazing story. And they had the most amazing visual collateral. I mean, their and their text was beautifully done, and their still images and their videos, and they had so much. It was like wet paint. You couldn't stop exploring and watching it and mm. getting involved. So on the one hand, oh, my God, and their cast. You probably didn't know their names, but some of them you knew. Uh, they were amazing actors. So And they were on camera a lot. Their video was mm-hmm. six minutes, a little bit long, six minutes. Um, I would have cut it down to about four, four and a half. Is, you know, I, I, mine was three, and I think that's a really good length. But I, you know, there are exceptions to every rule. So if there's a reason for it to be longer, it's okay. Um, the problem, they, here's where they really fell down. Two areas. And they're actually really critical. The first and the more obvious area was the video. And it was beautifully shot, beautifully edited. Everything in it was good. But what wasn't in it was devastating. These two brothers really were very shy, very, um, uh, they pushed the cast, they pushed everything out in front of them, and they stood up at the beginning of the video, and they introduced the video, and then we never saw, I don't know, I'm going to say it was 20, 30 seconds, and then we never saw them for six minutes again. Ah. And during their introduction, it was very almost factual. Matter of fact, it was not, there was no blood on the streets. There was no heartland. There was no soul being shared. So they never said, holy crap, um, you know, this is not our first film, but it's our most important. And here's why. And here's this. Can- and, you know, this, 
by the way, let us tell you why this story, like we could not, not direct this film. We will make this film. Yeah. This film means everything to us. And uh-huh. here's why. Um, and, and by the way, I don't know many filmmakers who don't feel that way about the project they're fully invested in, but they were not, they as human beings, as creative um, souls, were not present in the video. Their why was absent. Their uh-huh. motivation, their blood and guts and viscera and spleen were not present. And I don't know how, I don't care how brilliant, um, how uh, artfully uh, spoken these other people were, the people raising the money were kind of absentee landlords. Mm. So that was problem number one. And I had a long time, I was very, very, you know, direct with them and they were most appreciative and they completely understood it and agreed because it was pretty clear at that point they were not going to achieve their goal. Mm-hmm. That said, it's not a fatal, it's not a fatal problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a learning. This is all a learning. These guys are actually in beautiful position to go out and do it again. They had so much that was right about their campaign. Mm-hmm. There were two, two primary areas where they fell down. So if you fix those, the statistics tell you that if you don't hit your goal and you do another campaign on the same platform, Kickstarter, You've got a huge advantage. You're going to do at least 20%. I think statistically, on average, you'll do at least 20% more than you did your first time. And um, and then if you make a lot of good changes, you'll probably do even better than that. Because you already have awareness. You already have fans. You can communicate back to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so so they can go at it again. Here's the other problem, though. So the the, the, the heartland was missing in the video and elsewhere. And then they had like 30, I'm going to guess, I think, Doug, it was like 32 or 35 perks. Different different, different combinations or ways to say thank you to people who gave money. Well, Mm -hmm. there is is a, a line you don't want to cross. And that line is giving people so much choice that they can't choose. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so easy to get someone confused and, 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 and sort of paralyzed where they just turn away. Yeah. Confused and, mind says no. Yeah. So they had, they had a couple of rounds. They had 30 some odd perks, which is mm-hmm. way too many. They had within that, they had groupings. Like they might've had three perks at this price level and three perks at that uh-huh. price level. And it, it all, it all said, uh, at the end of the day, that was just, I think you should have at most half that many. It's like 15 is plenty. Um, mm-hmm. If you can get away with less, great. Uh, but but relevance is really important. And their yeah. stuff hinged way too much. Uh, to The majority of their perks involved their writer. So mm-hmm. it wasn't about, once again, it was not about them. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was a, a bit of a, a flaw in my estimation. Um, so in the, for example, in the Kickstarter program plan the, uh, thing that we did, we started out with a, we wanted a very low price point. So little barrier to entry. So we mm-hmm. start off with $15. Of course, anyone can mm-hmm. give a dollar if they want. That's yeah. great. Right. But in terms of the, the perks, quote unquote, we started off with $15, which was, we gave a digital book. Well, since it was a kind of book, the book, the ebook, 100% relevant. Yep. So we started with that, and then we jumped up to 35 and gave them a physical and a digital. Then we jumped up to 50 and we gave them, uh, I think it was four different kinds. Uh, we gave them the, all that plus an interactive workbook. Uh, and, and, and we jumped up quickly. So we went 15, 35, 50, 100, I think then to 200, and then to 50, and then 500, and 1,000. And that's pretty much it. So... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was, it was not hard for someone to say, I know where I sit. No, I'm not comfortable giving 50, but I really want the two versions. I'll do 35. We made it so it became really easy for people to see where they would place themselves on the map or the menu of pricing Mm -hmm. and in terms of what lit them up, the prices and the value offered for those prices, because it is a value exchange, right? 